Maybe you can talk a little bit about the, the sours and the, uh, the barrel program. Okay. Uh, well, it kind of all started when we were at Corbell. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things when I had Blind Pig was, as I mentioned earlier, we had plastic fermenters. So one yeah. thing we were really focused on was one yeast. So we used the uh, California ale yeast, Chico yep. ale yeast. Um, I was a customer of White Labs. Uh, before White Labs ever existed uh, back in the day. Chris. So yeah, Chris would, um, would he was getting his, uh, uh, I don't know, he was going to school. Doctorate with, or whatever. Yeah, doctorate yeah. in, I don't know, DNA toxicology or something. It wasn't that, I don't know what it was. But he would, he would, yeah, he would grow the yeast up in the lab at UCSD. <laughs> and he was selling it to uh, Homebrew Mart, which was a homebrew store in San yeah, Diego. Yeah, yeah. And then um, Pizza Port. Mm -hmm. And then we were his third customer. Oh. And I still remember when he got when he finished school. He's like, "Well, what what should I do?" And we were like, "You should open a yeast company." Uh, you need to and, hook me up. And, and uh, he yeah. was already selling pitchable quantities. That was his thing to the three of us. He was selling the homebrew vials to to homebrew mart, right? And then um, to Pizza Port, and then to us. So I would drive down there and uh, and pick up. I know this has nothing to do with the barrels, but it's kind of a funny. No, story. no, no, no. I, I, uh, here all I would it. I would drive down. I'd call him two weeks ahead of time. This is before cell like, phones. So he can build it up. And he could build it up. And then I was really busy with the brewery, and he was really busy with. With, with school and so I'd go to the mobile station on the corner it looked like a full-on drug deal and I'd call him from the pay you know the, the pay phone you know 25 cents hey I'm down the hill and he'll be like all right I'll meet you outside in five minutes and I drive up the hill to UCSD and he'd give me a brown bag of uh, yeast I'd give him a wad of cash and uh, I'd stuff it in a nice chest and off I would drive rarely did we ever stop and chat because we were so busy I really I had to get back to work but uh, this is how we bought our yeast for the whole time at uh, wow at uh, at Blind Pig and uh, so anyways you uh, almost just want to keep doing that just cause you yeah know what I mean? yeah like, wow yeah but uh, anyway so we were really careful not to use any other yeast because we didn't want to potentially Change impregnate the, the plastic you know oh. fermenters knowing you know if there was any uh, issue there we always wanted to have the same yeast so we never even delved into Belgian uh, mm -hmm. beers and let alone anything funky. Um, and so when we got to Corbell, uh, when I got to Corbell, I started uh, home brewing uh, with some Belgian yeast. And it was in 99 that we made Damnation, our first Belgian beer. Mm -hmm. And then from that, we were taking that, putting it into used wine barrels and adding Britannomyces. Mm. And the Brett was my favorite component out of a Lambic beer. Mm. And that was really where the whole barrel thing started. How did, you, how, did you, how did you know about Brett? From how did you know that that was your favorite my component? trip to Belgium. Okay. You know, back years before I would always remembered that you could find so it wasn't your favorite but you were kind of but you never oh, forgot I, I it. liked it was interesting All right. you know, yeah and um, and you could find Cantillon it was easier to get Cantillon back then than it is now yeah well you know now there's so the many success. more there's so many more and they haven't grown hardly any yeah. you know like Jean uh, Jean Van Roy the the son who runs Cantillon now he's what like fifth sixth generation mm. you know he told me once well, we're expanding I'm like what does that mean for you well we're adding a layer of barrels that's expanding to Cantillon, so. <laughs> yeah. But um, but I but I really like Brett, and I love I've always liked Orval too. Orval's you know, my my three favorite beers in no particular order: Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, Orval, and Duval. And mm -hmm. I like them all for different reasons, but I love I've always loved the Brett and Orval and the funkiness, and um, you know Cantillon for its wackiness with all the Brett and the bacterias and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And so for the first barrel beer, Temptation, we made this blonde, which ended, was really just damnation. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we added Brett to it. And that was in 98, 99. And yeah, post ferment. Okay. And, uh, we had two barrels to start. So in, in 98 or 99, took it to the GABF. It must have been 98, because I think we won an award with it at 99 at GABF. Mm -hmm. And two became four, four became six. So when we left Corbell, we only had six or eight barrels. Mm -hmm. uh, that was in 2003, and then when we started the pub, we, you know, specifically built a barrel room into the pub behind the bar. And when we built the, the pub on 4th Street for Russian River, we really wanted the barrel room to be the focal point. You know, nine times out of ten, you walk into a brew pub and you see a bunch of stainless. Yeah. And it's the same thing. Yeah. We wanted people to walk into our pub and not see any stainless. We wanted to be really huh. comfortable vibe and have barrels behind the bar and really kind of evoke a lot of questions why you have barrels yeah you know are you making wine here no we're making beer oh in wine country and you know that sort of thing uh -huh. and uh and so even when we started at the pub so we had already put out two or three batches of temptation 
while we were at Corbell, when Russian River was at Corbell, you know, we couldn't even sell it in the deli. The only person who bought it was a Tornado, Dave Keen at the Tornado. <laughs> yeah. Nobody bought funky beers, you know. Yeah. And now it seems like every bar has a Belgian tap, yeah. and a lot of them are selling funky beers without any trouble. Uh, but so the so when we got to the pub, so it's 2004, mm -hmm. uh, the first batch of Temptation was still just with Brett didn't have bacteria in it yet like it does now so the beer the beer has really evolved over time okay and then um, we had this idea to make a second beer which became supplication mm -hmm. and it was very clear what I wanted and I had this idea in my head and the flavors that I wanted it to be and and luckily we nailed it on the first batch mm -hmm. even though it was a year process what were the flavors and that you were shooting we wanted, for that were there? we wanted to use with Temptation, we always use Chardonnay barrels, mm -hmm. so we wanted to keep that theme going, except I wanted to use Pinot Noir barrels, because mm -hmm. I absolutely love Pinot Noir as a wine, yeah. and I love the subtlety and the, the finesse of, of Pinot. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted that cherry flavor to, uh, from the wine, from the barrels, you know, from the wine that was in the barrels yep. to come out. So we made a, a malt bill that you know, evoked a little more sweet uh, flavors, but then would ferment out using the Britannomyces. Yeah. But we, then, we also wanted the bacteria component to have more acidity than what the Brett would contribute. Mm -hmm. And so, and then we also wanted to have a secondary sugar, something that Peter Buchart from New Belgium has always taught me that if you want complex flavors in your barrel beers, don't just use conventional sugars or don't just use the residual sugar that's left in the beer. You know, throw some fruit in and see what kind of flavor you get mm -hmm. and you might get a more complex flavor. And in the early mm -hmm. years of doing the barrel beers, there wasn't anyone to go to except Peter. Uh, Tom, Tommy Arthur at Lost Abbey and I kind of, uh, you know, learn together because mm -hmm. we were both started out making these beers together and we would share almost all of our, you know, information, if not all of our information, but yeah, brothers Peter, in arms. Peter was the only one we could go to. And Peter would only give us a little bit of information. <laughs> we were looking for this much information, yeah, but yeah. he would only give us a little bit. But he, he did that on purpose because it really made us grow and do things our own way and we didn't just copy the way he did things. Okay. Um, and, and really, I think it was because of that it helped develop our whole style, which is to use uh, you know, wine barrels that and match specific types of wine barrels with a specific beer. Mm -hmm. So Temptation is in Chardonnay barrels, Supplication, you know, is in Pinot Noir barrels, mm -hmm. and now Consecration is in Cabernet barrels where we add currants to it. And with Consecration, you've got, you know, when you drink a Cabernet, you often get, you know, chocolate, tobacco type flavors. You sometimes get, you know, cassis, currants, those similar flavors, mm -hmm. berry type flavors. Mm -hmm. So we made a beer with chocolate malt to give some chocolate flavors darker. Uh, we always ferment pretty warm to get big fruity ester mm -hmm. profiles on the supplication and the consecration. Is that mid -70s or what, and, are you, what are you shooting yeah, for? Yeah, exactly. Okay. And yeah. we'll, uh, now we tend to mash quite high. Uh, 159 is probably pretty low mash time, you know, it's probably the average 159, 160, wow. almost to the point where we're killing the, the enzymes and, um, and we're doing this so that we leave a lot of residual sugar. So it leaves a lot of For the, the bugs uh, secondary the, yeah, to make their flavor. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. we're leaving a lot of complex sugars. Uh, behind, so now we'll finish uh, primary fermentation. So they don't for have these. Eat, they're not gonna make the flavors. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. yeah, make them work really hard. It's, it's stress the bread out, make them work hard. Well, and, I don't know about uh, the stress part of it. I mean, the bread's so interesting in that you know, it's so insidious. You know, in general like this, if there's if there's no residual sugars, and if it's still going, it'll turn around and start breaking down the lignin yeah, of the yeah, wood, yeah, exactly. and pulling sugars out of that. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's kind of like so. Yeah. He's not the problem. Yeah, <laughs> but funny enough, all of the other guys you know, all the other bacteria and stuff, they are much more fastidious, much, much more difficult to kind of keep going. So you think like, oh, an infection is going yeah. to be easy. But, you know, did you ever experience that? Like you were pitching things and you kind of found like, huh. Yeah, we, we've learned over the years that we like leaving the residual sugar. Yeah, just for what because you said. Because of that, okay, yeah. gotcha. And, um, yeah. and so we do that through, like I said, a high mash temperature, yeah, leaving yeah, yeah. a lot of uh, unfermentables. Uh, we also under pitch. Uh, those beers will probably pitch half the yeast as normal. Oh, really? Um, you know, if, if a pitch, say a normal pitch for 100 barrels of Belgian beer here is 250 pounds, mm -hmm. we may only pitch 125, 150 pounds for, mm -hmm. a, a, you know, one of those big tanks of uh, oh. 100 barrels of, of a base beer to be a funky beer. Mm -hmm. And um, and in doing so, that also kind of stifles the fermentation late and it peters out and leaving sugar. Okay. And, um, and then you add the sugar, the fruit, you know, as well. So you're adding more sugars there. And we'll also only add the Brett early on, about a million cells of Brett uh, per ml um, for the first eight weeks. And that gives the Brett a good head start. One thing we've learned is that if you add bacteria right from the get-go and the bacteria happens pH. to take off and the pH drops, Oosh. 
uh, it hangs out. gets to gets to 3.4 too quick pH, the brett will stop working. And the 3.4, 3.5 is when we really see the yeah. brett stop working. So, so now we always do the brett fermentation early on. So we start with the primary with the Belgian yeast to mm -hmm. do the initial kind mm -hmm. of heavy lifting. Uh, and then we'll spin the beer through the centrifuge here at the production brewery the yeast out. to get the primary yeast out. And then we'll go. So you're not relying on any autolysis from the yeast end for um, nutrient sets. You're just leaving residuals from the mash bill. No, yeah, ah, yeah. And okay. then um, it's pretty cool. And we've got one tank. Uh, the tank that's behind the camera is a, <laughs> a funky tank. It's uh -huh. a hundred barrel bright tank that we bought from Dogfish. It looks head. so normal from and, the outside. Uh, yeah, yeah. And you <laughs> you might want to film it after, but there's a I, bunch yeah. of hoses yeah. uh, that have red tape on so them. So those only live and with that the tank, right? Pump behind you guys. Red is red. <laughs> Um, the cage over there, again, you can't see this on film, Anything but they'll film it later. Dead. Anything red is funky. And so a red bucket means funky, red tape. Um, I actually just learned yesterday, one of our uh, brewers is, comes from the biotech world. He's kind of new to us. He's only been with us for about four or six months. Mm -hmm. And you can even get red triclamp gaskets, I, I just <laughs> learned. So we're going to switch those out. So we really, uh, yeah. we laugh and joke about it. No, we're, but, but, it's, we but act, it's, that was one of the questions yeah, coming up was like, man, how are you dealing yeah, with this in the brew this house? This is how we do with it. So we have separate everything. We have separate pumps, valves, gaskets, uh, filters, bottling equipment. Um, yeah. We probably have... We probably have almost $100,000 wrapped up in just funky equipment now between filters and pumps and yep. a tank and a bottler that, you know, we have a $50,000 bottler that only gets used a dozen times a year. But those are the steps you have to take. That's the to funky be, bottler? Yeah, to be totally sure that you don't have a cross contamination. Yeah, and even then, you're still not 100% sure that it isn't going to happen. Um, you know, we, we do a or? lot of we do a lot of uh, obviously micro work on the tanks. Uh, <laughs> you think? Uh, a, a normal we the only we have one or two tanks that switch back and forth from funky to non-funky. Really? And so the rest of our tanks either are you're funky or you're not. But the one or two tanks that are the normal process would be let's say we emptied it had funky beer in it we emptied it. So it's got all funky parts on it. We would take our, our funky uh, CIP cleaning pump mm -hmm. and do a full caustic cycle, okay. full acid cycle, okay. lots of hot water in between. Then we strip all the parts off the tank, convert it over to non-funky, and then do a whole nother CIP okay. uh, with caustic and Sandwiching acid. Sandwiching on either side. And then, we're, right. and then we do micro work on it um, before we fill it again. Um, but it's still not to say that something can't happen, but I think we've done almost everything we can. can be done. We even have a whole fleet of kegs that are just funky. Uh, we've got kegs that have a wrap that say uh, funky, uh, Brett Lactone, PDO, something like that, that's, that's on the, the keg itself. So we, we've even isolated the keg, so even the rubber gasket on the keg isn't being switched back and forth from uh, you know, a funky beer to a non-funky beer. Brew pub and we've never had a, a problem. Really? We just, it's just as, as, as our business has grown, and we've been able to afford more of these things mm -hmm. uh, and afford to reinvest in the funky program, we've, we've done what we can. So, you know, back in the day, I'm not as worried about a stainless part because it's not porous. Yeah. But back in the day, we would caustic the parts and, and switch them back and forth because we couldn't afford it. Well, as, as our business has grown and we've been able to afford it, we now have a whole set of you know, yeah, tri clamps just, and valves and T's and things that aren't porous, but yeah. still, we have the ability to keep them separate. Why we, not? We keep them separate. Why yeah. Not? So, um, but but back to the process. So then, after eight to ten weeks uh, in the uh, in the barrel mm -hmm. uh, with just the brett, and if it's a fruited beer, the fruit will have already been added. Uh, then we'll add the bacteria to it. And uh, what's your more decision brett? process between before? Are you just going by sensory? Um, are you getting the funk you want yet, or a repeated it's, shift, or something uh, happening? Or are you honestly, just kind of this sounds too so casual, but it's whenever we get around to it. You know, <laughs> okay. we, we know that six uh, weeks is too soon. Okay. And we know that after ten weeks, we're just wasting our time. And but it doesn't get worse. Uh, no, it's but, done but, what it's going to do. But it, it's done what it's going to do for the most part. That's pretty convenient, though. And for the most part, we give ourselves a window because if yeah. if we've got a bottle plant production reality, yeah, there's other production issues that come into play. Um, so we give ourselves kind of a window, and early on it'll um, have a two-part fermentation lock bung so it can exhaust yep. CO2, the and then there's a, uh, a hard bung that we'll switch to after we've 
top the barrel with the bacteria and topped it up with more brett. Oh, okay. And then we go to what we call, so that's what we call a, a soft bung. Uh, then we go to a hard bung. And at that point, we almost never Just uh, open it again. Uh, when we're pulling samples from the barrel, um, you can see on the barrels there's a nail on, uh, and you may want to, maybe you can film that later on, get close up. Uh, I was a told nail to ask about the Vinny and, nail and, and the cork. Yeah, so I'm really glad this uh, is coming up. That's the, that's my contribution, I guess. Double IPAs and the the, the stainless the nail. steel nail. Uh, so let's talk about the nail. And uh, so the nail um, and there's a cork down at six o'clock. Uh, that's a, a regular <laughs> cork that you'd use on For the Belgian bottle, and that's a 15 16 OD hole. That's how we actually get all the liquid out when the beer is ready to be emptied. The nail is there to pull a sample. Um, we we so you the, don't bother unstacking. No, nah. you, just, you just drain, boom, and well, boom. we'll we'll pull them out. Oh, when we're draining the barrels, yeah, we pull them out four at a time. Okay, but but to, just to pull a sample, um, we'll pull the nail out, get the sample what we need. And the reason we do that is that you've got the pellicle, the film yeast, yeah. that hopefully the brett forms on the top it. layer. You don't want to break it with a wine or a beer thief. And so the nail was an idea I had. And first I was looking at little like wood dowels and. Um, I even looked at a golf tee, you know, <laughs> I went to the golf store and bought a bag of tees, but those are made of just like composite yeah, wood, oh shitty man. wood. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> uh, and, and I, and I was like, what about a nail? And I looked up in McMaster car, the stainless nail. The, yeah. They sell stainless nails. And uh, so it's a seven sixty fourths inch hole, uh, that you drill out 77 64th drill bit. Um, it's, uh, whatever size nail, uh, if anyone's ever seen my, funky beer presentations. I even have McMaster car part numbers on it. You can buy a box of stainless steel nails for like the price you would buy 10 of them at Home Depot. So it's yeah. easier to just go to McMaster car. Yeah. And, uh, and that's how we pull samples. And then the okay. cork was an idea. Again, we used to have a, a, a system where we'd have a wand and try to pump it out with a, with a, a diaphragm pump. And mm -hmm. it, it was okay with temptation, but once we got the fruit, we had to come oh, up with solids. a different way. So we pull the cork. Uh, jam the tubing in. Uh, we can do four barrels at a time, so two racks. And um, then the uh, four tubes go into a strainer, and then the strainer goes so to a pump. So it's, it's, it's pump live when you're tapping that with the tube, and then you're barrel and you like, pop the cork yeah. and then get that. Yeah, yeah you get pretty good at Exciting. it. Exciting, yeah. So then we uh, take the barrels outside, uh, remove all the fruit. Um, so you leave the solids of the fruit in the whole entire time. time? Yeah. However yeah, many although, months, although, years, whatever? Yeah, usually six to 12 months. Uh, although um, something that I've learned from some of the Belgian Lambic brewers that they're doing now is taking the beer out of the barrels and just putting it into a stainless tank for eight weeks, and they're getting all the extraction they need out of the fruit in that short time. For us, our process, it works better this way. Okay. So we just don't have a, a bunch of tanks to do this or mm -hmm. a, a, an isolated tank. So. For us, this process just works better. Got it. So, but uh, we have now on, so we make a framboise once a year. It's a mm. fundraiser beer we do for the local breast care center. Mm -hmm. And uh, with that, we age the beer for nine months and then take the beer, add the fruit to it. And um, well, it's only like six weeks on the, on the fruit. So it really, um, we, we have learned that it doesn't have to be a long period of time, but okay. that's with soft, fresh fruit. Mm -hmm. All the fruit we use for the most part is dried. So for supplication, oh. they're dried cherries. For consecration, they're currants, which is dried. So I think with the, I think with our dried fruit, you need more time to let the beer penetrate the, uh, the fruit. True? It's not gonna happen in as short of a time. Um, and then we clean the barrels. We'll typically use the barrels three times. Uh, so we typically have a mix of one, two, and three-year-old barrels. Mm -hmm. After the third use, we pull them out. Uh, we either take them to our pub and use them on our spontaneous uh, beer program that we have over there. We have a cool ship, a horny mm -hmm. tank at the pub now that we'll spontaneously ferment in. Or if we have too many barrels, we'll just sell them off to a uh, local uh, furniture maker or barrel salesperson, and they'll cut them half, sell them as planters. No yeah. winery wants them back. Yeah. You know. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, I was, actually, I was actually surprised to, to learn that you do both like your sour program and your standard program here in the same facility. Yeah, I yeah, well, it's, it's our only, I mean, if you think about a brewery like Cantillon, it, yeah. it's pretty easy. They only make funky beers. That's what I mean. Yeah, but, That's but, easy, for, but for us, yeah, and, and most other breweries in America that do this, you know, there's very few breweries only doing exclusively funky beers. I mean, there are some, mm. um, but you kind of have to. 
at our level now, if there was any reason why I would want to do one more expansion, mm -hmm. it would be to separate all this out, to have this isolated in its own building, and then um, you know have our non-funky beers in a, in yeah. a controlled, you know, both have them both in a controlled environment. That's really the reason why I'd want to grow our business again. It's not so much because I'd want to add more capacity, just, the, the security. just more for that security and peace of mind, yeah. and we'll probably do it someday. So. Mm. But, but again, we have a pretty good handle on what we're doing, and it works. So, are you tailoring uh, grain bills uh, to kind of for what the individual combination of the bugs bring out? Uh, more for the overall flavor that we're looking for, we're tailoring the grain bill. So you know, for the supplication, we're trying to match it with flavors that we get from the Pinot uh, barrels. Mm -hmm. You know, that a little more fruity uh, this to it. So we're using um, you know more crystal malts and that sort of thing. Uh, for the consecration, we're going with more dark malts, mm -hmm. you know, that using chocolate malt or Carafa 3 to get some more tobacco chocolate type mm -hmm. flavors that, is, that are flavors that you would taste in a Cabernet potentially, trying to meld all those flavors together. So it together. like the, the grain bill to the wine profile that was in the barrel. Yeah, yeah, what less a, to do with the funk. Okay, so less so, to do with the funk. The funk yeah. just, it does what it does? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. But you do have to take into account the acidity that it's going to add. Yeah. You can't have too high of a BU's on the beer. Uh, one of the worst things you can have is a high BU beer, a high acidity beer, and then you add the carbonic acid from the carbonation, then you have all these sharp flavors. Edgy, edgy, edgy. Yeah, that aren't rounded. So, I mean, most of our funky beers are 12 to 15 uh, BUs. Mm -hmm. For our spontaneous beer, we're using all aged hops. Okay. Uh, as we go forward, and as hops have come back down in price, uh, we are aging. Um, uh, Styrian Goldings oh. and probably start using more aged hops. Okay. In, in more of these beers. So. And just basically buying boxes, opening them up, and sitting on them? or like uh, Yeah, or just sitting on them, leaving yeah. them out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe open them up, re tape yeah. them. Oxygen. Yeah. There you go. So, boof. Yeah. But for our spontaneous beer, we are using aged uh, hops. So we're just okay. about halfway through our second bale of uh, spalt hops that <laughs> were 10 years old. Yeah. Now we're buying pellets and aging them because they're Jeez. just easier to work with. Yeah, they're getting really cheesy. So. Yeah. Thanks a lot for allowing us to come out here. Yeah, it was a pleasure having you guys. Really nice and, to be uh, here. Uh, yeah, we nice met maybe to... like eight or nine years ago. Yeah. It's nice to kind of catch back up again yeah, and absolutely and, see uh, the success. Nice to go through, uh, you know, talk about everything that we're doing. Yeah, uh, well, it's close to a lot of our hearts. Yeah, well, thank you. Thanks. So it's pretty so, good. I'm still a home brewer at heart. So. But you know what? That's the best way to do it. <laughs> yeah. You can tell the quality and the taste and consistency yeah. is beautiful. Well, thank you. Thanks. Thank Thanks you very much, words. man. Yep. Yep. Really appreciate yep. it. Yep. Cheers.